The following is intended for mature audiences only. Welcome to the news from La La Land Podcast. Yeah! Hello and welcome to the news from La La Land, where, again, three strange siblings are going to be sharing their story through pop culture, philosophy, and the creative nonsense. <laughs> I am Sarah. I'm, well, Sarah Sokol, to be precise, and I'm here with my brother Nick, the eldest. Hello! Eld Eldish. And Steph, who is the youngest. The very babyest of us all. Youngish. <laughs> yes. Um, so, how are you all doing lately? <sighs> I'm so glad you asked, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and with a sentence that starts out with a sigh like that, do you really want to know how it's going to be? <laughs> Well, my life is great, really. I mean, I was just thinking the other day about how that there are probably people in the world who would kill to have my problems. You know what? I'm going to be honest. I never understood why that made anyone feel better, <laughs> that there are other people who want what you have. Yeah, problems are subjective. This makes me feel mm. guilty. Oh, it really interesting. It makes you feel guilty. Uh, yes, but other than it's, other than guilt, it's supposed to inspire gratitude. I mean, it just inspires wanting to give it to people who need it more. Well, maybe that will make you happy too. I guess, as long as we're all happy in the end. I'm assuming you're talking about like which part of your house to remodel. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Or like a coworker of mine was talking about how he was in a big fight with his children and wife over moving to another state. And he lives in like, like an $800,000 house. His options are like selling it and building another one for cheaper and using the money to buy another house and get a rental and like versus moving to another still like the options that he is throwing around that not everyone has, but it was killing him. So it just goes to show you that suffering is universal. Sure. But also it goes to show you some suffering is worse than other suffering. And you can ease some of that suffering by giving yourself a little bit more. Wait, what? <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, it, it doesn't inspire gratitude in me. It, it inspires a revolution to overthrow the bourgeoisie. You're going to have to connect the dots for me there, Steph. <laughs> I feel like I understand what Steph is saying, and I understand what Nick is saying, and I don't understand why you don't understand what each other are saying, but also... This None of this was what the intro topic was supposed to be about. <laughs> well, do you think, Sarah, do you think that uh, when, when we were recording as kids, we were talking about overthrowing the bourgeoisie? Well, I don't think we were 21 when we were doing that, to be fair. I feel like if you're 21 and you're not thinking about overthrowing the bourgeoisie, <laughs> then there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to catch people up here, when I'm talking about recordings we made as kids, Sarah and I were actually talking about this earlier this week, and we realized that technically this is not our first podcast we've done together. Oh, do tell. When we were really little, we had a, uh, a, a tape deck with record button, and we loved to listen to audiobooks back then. Uh, we sing silly songs, a bunch of, we had a bunch of audio content that we loved to listen to as kids. And so we always wanted to make our own versions of it. So we recorded books together, mm -hmm. uh, shows of various kinds, sing, sing along. Yep. Tapes. We got along sickeningly well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But I mean, like that was all of us for the most part. We all just got along really well. Yeah, true. Did you and Emma do that as well? You did your own recordings? I imagine at some point. I feel like we just spent a ludicrous amount of time in each other's company being homeschooled and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was, I was thinking, I was actually remembering we did uh, one tape uh, a few years back. We, were, we found those in a drawer and we were listening to them. And I had an audio book where I was, there's no book to go with it. Actually, it wasn't a book. It was just a story I was telling. But kids books always have a little noise that it makes when it's time to turn the page yeah, okay. and so <laughs> so i remember i was uh you, it was you and i together we were describing the sounds of the city waking up we were like the bells were ringing and there was uh the kids time to go to school and the bells sounded like this and the sound <laughs> to turn the page was uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it went, and the bells sounded like this. Uh, <laughs> ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> we should release those tapes as a bonus episode at some point. <laughs> for our for our special supporters. We should use them in our recording projects as like creepy little kid voices in the background. Oh god. Uh, yes. Hey, so um Sarah, as I think you pointed out, we've entirely derailed ourselves. I guess I did have one little point of business before getting into things. Um the listeners, of course, you all know by now, you can find us on you know, mainly Chris Thiele, uh listens to us on Spotify. <laughs> And, you know, Hi, other places, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, everywhere where you can find podcasts, basically. But uh, we also recently started releasing them on YouTube, which I know is an easier place for people to leave comments. And so we're hoping that maybe we can get some listeners, if you are interested, in submitting some ideas for pop culture moments. Uh, we would even take... Probably I haven't run this by any anyone else, but um, like pointless conjecture questions could be really fun. Oh, too. if it's a good one, I'll be up for yeah. it. Yeah. Um. So, uh, yeah, feel free to leave us a comment, or again, you can send us an email anytime. Uh, but enough about that. Um, speaking of pop culture moments, we didn't need your help this week, at least. We will be discussing Star Wars pop culture moment. Yeah. Our relationship with Star Wars goes back surprisingly far for how much you've heard us rant about how little technology we had. <laughs> I remember having a lot of, like, Star Wars action figures growing up. We saw the movies pretty early as well. Well, not only did we see the movies early, that was the, the first uh, movie that we ever saw in theaters. Which you're probably thinking... What, you didn't you grow up in the 90s? Yes, we did. And that was when the unfortunately remastered original three Star Wars movies were, movies were being re-released. And so they were actually out in theaters. And I remember, uh, yeah, I think we went to go see A New Hope in theaters re-released. Wow. I have no memory of that. <laughs> that was like the only movie that I saw in probably the in a theater in my first like 12 years of life really yeah hmm, that definitely changed by the time it got to me they were like eager to get rid of you guys <laughs> oh no no no! we would just go to movies together oh yeah it was like i'm pretty sure it was like star wars re-release and then lord of the rings uh was like the next thing down the road so many many Wait, years so you watched it... lord of the rings in theaters oh i mean it makes sense that you would have i think only the return of the king for me yeah yeah i think we didn't start watching uh movies in theaters until until yeah probably return of the king was coming out that was in 2003 wow return of the king came out in 2003 yeah god I'm getting old <laughs> <laughs> so um mike you kind of referenced there you didn't see many movies in theaters because you didn't see many movies and our parents were like super selective even with me with the movies and shows they would let me watch you know mom would always vet it to make sure that it was clean and mm -hmm. cl well clean by her definition yeah i just don't know why they let a show that's basically just a space western with mm -hmm. sexy bikini women and laser blasters <laughs> Didn't you just sort of state it like space western? What was dad super into? Louis L'Amour books. Oh, uh, yeah. Love those cowboy movies. Roy Rogers. We talked about this last week mm -hmm. or last episode. He had a special place in his heart for hippie shit, too. And Star Wars has some hippie shit it in there. It surrounds us. It <laughs> penetrates. <laughs> yeah, always going on about energy. <laughs> Yeah, well, but uh, but I think the main thing, and it's the same reason that the Orthodox are okay with with Lord of the Rings, is that they're in Star Wars. There's a very very clear good and evil, and the good guys are super obvious, and the bad guys are super obvious. Yeah, it's the black hats and the white hats. Yeah, like <laughs> like the Western. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Dad was always willing. Like, remember when they showed us, um, and the Blues Brothers is one, but also. My cousin Vinny. They let you watch this as kids? Not as kid no. kids, but like when we were teenagers. They introduced it to us just because they thought that they were so funny and they loved it so much. Really? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. Even though they were like, this is bad. Obviously, all of this is yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much swearing in my cousin Vinny, but the booby is it's so funny like they just had to share it yeah. with us you know and i and i definitely get that now that like i'm a parent and i have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and every time they just reach a new age that that i can show them another one of my favorite things it's just so exciting for me like oh like i like i recently just showed them star wars really obviously they haven't seen every star wars movie <gasps> Did, which one but in the last couple of months we watched all the, all the three originals, episode four, five, and six. And then we also watched episodes one and two. <gasps> and then additionally, we are probably about halfway through the old um, Clone Wars uh, animated series. Oh, uh, cool. Which we've been watching it in the evenings sometimes. In place of reading a family book, we, sit, we watch an episode of... Star Wars Clone oh, man, Wars. That, so they're getting they're getting into it. <laughs> that was a great show. It was a little tedious sometimes. I mean, your kids are really going to love the whole episode about deregulating banks. <laughs> <laughs> that is such prequel shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I found it interesting when I watched it. But... There's a lot of politics in that show, yeah. for sure. Well, I mean, we were kind of going to talk about that, how, like, the prequels, when they came out, they were so um, hated by, like, staunch Star Wars fans, but kids like them. So do you find when you're showing your kids all of the movies at this age, they kind of treat them all the same? They're, like, all an adventure, and they like all of them kind of equally? Uh, I would I would think so, actually, Yeah. They they don't they haven't really shown a liking for one more over the other. They just like all of them. They just want to see more lightsabers and laser blasters and they they actually I think they do like on their tablets and stuff. They they have some like Lego Star Wars games. I think the characters they're most familiar with are Luke and Leia and Darth Vader. So like the classic characters. So and it seems like they're identifying more with them. And I think it might have been due to some pre exposure. To those mm. characters mm. in other like cartoons. I mean, Star Wars is fucking everywhere now. Oh yeah. How does it feel to be uh, so uh, excited about something that mainstream? <laughs> I'm. I actually have been saying something to that effect uh, for a long time. I mean, I'll be honest. I was into Twilight. You guys, this is not new territory for me. <laughs> no. What I was gonna say is like what I often say is. Um, if someone tells me a thing I just said is a cliche, like if I just, you know, compare Masha to a summer's day or something, people would be like, oh, that's so cliche. Well, I always think it's probably cliche for a reason. Yeah, because it's so nice. I mean, yeah. obviously for a thing to appeal to the least common denominator, ergo be popular, it, it's got to simplify a little, but it's probably still some good stuff in there if millions of people like it. Ah, true words. <laughs> it's all, a lot of it is about just capturing the imagination and just allowing yourself to be taken somewhere. Like, if you're open to paying these beautiful compliments and are not afraid of sounding cliche or cheesy or whatever then you know you're open to having a more maybe a richer relationship and the same is true of your relationship with pop culture i think well i think the uh the movie um enchanted really speaks to what you're talking about here does it <laughs> in disney and <laughs> disney enchanted where the guy's in a dry like kind of looks good on paper but not very passionate relationship yeah. and then he he thinks of true love as it's seen in fairy tales as being cheesy but then in the end cheesy true love uh is really what makes his life better and everyone cries and it's great i say everyone i mean me <laughs> yeah. i really love it's that an actually, it's actually a good movie yeah i like it we should watch it sometime <laughs> Yeah, we'll just have a watch party oh, on man. the podcast. You'll hear the yeah. audio in our commentary. <laughs> yeah, sounds so fun. <laughs> It'll just be, how does she know that you love her? Oh, I love this song. How do you show her you love her? <laughs> how do you show her you really, really, truly love her? <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I sing the rest and we get disenfranchised by all of our franchises. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Nick, you had, you've sort of brought up before that, like, 
Star Wars does sort of have a reputation for being sci-fi for some reason, but it is obviously unbelievable and completely unscientific. I mean, it's, and it relies on magic. Verging on hippie lore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you used this word that I wasn't really familiar with, sci-fantasy. What uh, d yeah. Define that term for me. Well, I feel like a lot of fantasy can fall into this sci-fantasy category depending how you stretch the term but in my mind star wars is just the best example because it comes across as all sci-fi but when you look at the reasons behind everything it's all about feelings and magic and hope and friendship and stuff like that mm. um, well, and whereas you look at star trek which is total sci-fi camp those are kind of the two classic uh, examples of the difference between sci-fantasy and sci-fi well and in star trek there's an attempt made to make it seem real like a like a realistic future yeah like this could happen in the year 3021 or whatever and yeah. different various <laughs> sci-fi films get it more or less right ac you know in terms of accuracy of or plausibility i should say not accuracy but plausibility in terms but star wars i mean like people there's gravity on every planet and people can survive and breathe and live there like the pressure you know every ship uh has gravity um there's an up and a down in space there's noise in space yeah i mean there's fire they're in not space. even making an attempt <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah explosions i mean leia that whole floating thing don't even get me started <laughs> <laughs> actually i think the reason that bothered so many people and here's my my personal theory about this is that it almost felt like a star wars attempt to be scientifically believable or in terms of the physics of it you know the fact that she was going across and turning icy and cold and floating through space you don't see things floating through space in star wars really that much i don't think i mean like in Rogue One, or I think it's Rogue One, when they're dropping bombs down, they're like in space, but they're dropping bombs and they're falling. Oh, yeah, when they're above that facility or whatever. And then, and then suddenly you see this movie where Leia's floating and it looks all kind of science-y for a second. And then suddenly you start thinking about the plausibility, right? It never occurred to you before. Like, it's just Star Wars universe. There's gravity everywhere. Everyone can breathe anywhere. There's a lot of hand waving you do so that you can tell the the real story of Star Wars, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's an alternate yeah. universe that exists with its own physics. It could be. Now, I have to ask, have any of us read any Star Wars books? I personally have not because it's possible that the books dive into these because there's so many books. <laughs> Does fan fiction count? Um Isn't that what the books are? Was it like sexy fan fiction? <laughs> like Chewbacca gets pregnant with Han's that's baby. That's a real. That's a real. Um, well, not Han, but Chewbacca shipping <laughs> is a real thing that happens. Really? Oh, people think he's cute or something. <laughs> <laughs> or something. <laughs> they just like the way his hair hey, waves in not, the wind. <laughs> we're not writing Chewbacca fan fiction out here. <laughs> uh, but no, none of the actual like book books mm -hmm. why why do you ask well i don't know i was just thinking like it's possible we'll have some listeners who are super into star wars and and they'll know some of the answers like oh actually there are a bunch of planets where there isn't gravity but they just didn't show any of them in the movies <laughs> right because why would anyone go there i yeah, mean exactly. that's a fair point you could <laughs> argue that like the galaxy is a big place and they have light speed or hyperspace yeah, it must be speed over can, light speed. <laughs> must be over light speed because they seem to get there pretty quickly. Uh, and of all the planets, I guess they would only travel to the ones with breathable atmospheres. Yeah, although they have the capability to easily survive in environments where that don't support life, like on an asteroid inside of a giant creature's mouth <laughs> or underneath the water on a gungan planet situation <laughs> do you hear yeah. what you're describing gungan planet situation <laughs> inside of a monster's <laughs> mouth this isn't real <laughs> <laughs> steph take your realism and your cynicism and shove it in your gungan's 
<laughs> mouth. <laughs> the Gungans mouth. <laughs> well, we keep talking about Gungans. I just want to say the whole Jar Jar Binks thing. <laughs> I was no, I was guilty of of lambasting him as much as the next person, but as you should be. There's a no. What? As you should be. As I should be guilty? <laughs> well, you should lambast him, I guess. No, no, you shouldn't. Like, he got so much hate, and he was basically tortured for it. Like, there was a whole big thing. Oh, really? Where he spoke out against the treatment that he had gotten by all of the Star Wars fans who hated Jar Jar Binks so much. Ah, oh, because his because his accent was seemed to be silly and, like... Yeah, people thought it was derogatory. Or, like, he's making fun of some other, uh, like, sort of pigeon english kind of thing yeah i'm he like went into a whole depression because of it and everything um so this is kind of like serious stuff to be real but i just didn't want to like gloss over star wars and and gloss over his treatment especially because um you know early star wars films not super inclusive in terms of different races uh <laughs> I don't want to, like, misrepresent what he was saying. I know he went through, like, a bunch of ma backlash, and it was serious, and he went through real mm. depression because of it, but the part I'm not sure of is the accent <laughs> part. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I guess it's bad enough if he, if he, uh, yeah. I guess sometimes when you, when you heavily criticize a character like that, you forget that there was a dude there who made the decision to, <laughs> to talk and act like that, <laughs> and then that he's going to experience the backlash that you're creating that's true well it's still frustrating though it's still he's an annoying character and i think that it has nothing to do with the actor it was an it was a direction choice <laughs> i don't know if you watch enough theory videos they'll have you convinced he's a powerful jedi secretly like a drunken master yeah, exactly. kind of thing <laughs> ah. but he still screwed everything up like they have him portrayed as so stupid yeah especially if you go back and watch the the clone the clone wars show he literally overthrew the republic <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, hey, you know, you were talking about inclusivity also, and uh, I, I also was going to say I think it's interesting that Star Wars has uh, survived the scrutiny of our or of our modern generation and is still popular. Have a, any theories on why, why Star Wars, despite being made in the 70s, hasn't been canceled as many things have been? Well, maybe because they've made more attempts as the franchise develops into the new generations they're making more efforts to include more diversity they have a lady main character and a poc main character yeah that's true i just think that like i don't know holding it to the standard of it being made in the 70s <laughs> uh, i don't know would be kind of unfair of people i think i mean cancel it for something that they're continuing to do despite protest or i don't know i you know? i think that unproblematic movies can like old movies can be unproblematic for example last night uh masha and i watched 12 angry men which i think was from like 1954 and i yeah. mean it was very progressive as a movie that's true um but like when you, when you're talking about just casting lando calrissian is an awesome character that many people love right I, I don't know if him being the only one makes the whole thing problematic, you know, sure. especially because James Earl Jones featured prominently, although to oh. be fair, he was the bad guy, but <laughs> and played by and well in the care and he was acted by someone else. Like it was only by the a voice white of... person. Yeah. But only because he had to be Luke's dad. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. Uh, yeah. Well, and there's the, uh, the other factor in Star Wars that that's. It's always like the little guy is fighting against the, like the giant imperial. I mean, it's and it's so anti-imperial. Like, yeah. I don't know. That's that's really uh, right. And all the main characters are like kind to droids and alien creatures and stuff. Yeah, they have empathy. Right. And... Like, yeah, that's true. If you think about aliens being included, then it's even more that's inclusive. That's true. More <laughs> inclusive than real <laughs> life. <laughs> I, a, a friend of mine shared a podcast, a Canadian podcast with me. Now I can't remember what it was, but they were, it was an, 
it was a indigenous native podcast where they were talking about how star why star wars is so popular and among a lot of natives oh interesting here in the u.s and uh and that was and that was one of their suggestions too was that it was you know it's the little you know ragtag group uh out outgunned outmatched uh, but they win, you know, in Star Wars, like the little guy comes up and beats the big imperial power, you know, so it's kind of like it's a great it's a great fantasy yeah, uh, for people that have been really, you know, oppressed and, you know, exterminated even. Right. Are there any other sci fantasy types of things you can think of off the top of your head that you've been into now that you're aware of the term or Steph was already aware, but. <laughs> Because I can't really think of any off the top of my head. I, I've always been leaning towards more of the oh, fantasy. Oh, I have one. I have one, though. Oh. Uh, Treasure Planet. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. I, I wouldn't yeah, have I thought think. of that. I mean, they're sailing a literal ship between planets. That seems pretty oh. sci-fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, what about Firefly? Oh, the, yeah. The show Firefly. That might be... Yeah, that might be sci fantasy. I know it all, it kind of feels like might a D and D like a yeah. D and D um party. The the yeah. crew of that ship <laughs> really. Yeah. And the adventures they get into and everything. Yeah. That's a good example. Yeah, totally. I should have thought of that one. <laughs> yeah. Man, I want to go back and watch Firefly now. I would do that with you. Even knowing my favorite character dies. Hey, I, I missed the Don't fi- remind me I about missed that. the Firefly craze. <laughs> Completely. I heard a bunch of people complaining, but I never watched it. I might still. Don't spoil this. <gasps> oh, oh okay. watch it. Watch it, and then watch the movie Serenity afterwards. So you, because you see, so you get the, so you get the benefit of of being able to watch the show and then immediately watch Serenity afterwards. Whereas the people who originally watched Firefly when it came out just had to be left with a cliffhanger when their show was canceled and had to wait years for that shit you to come out. You are still very salty about this, aren't you? I don't think we we didn't have to wait. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just salty in general. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we should all make a concerted effort to do that. Maybe we can go we can talk about Firefly next time. <laughs> Uh, mm, if the would audience awesome. would be interested, let us know. <laughs> well, and does anyone have any more Star Wars thoughts? Any favorite quotes? Favorite quote from the film, maybe? Uh, well, I could tie them together, I, uh, the two sub- sections together, and say that I have a favorite song that my mom used to sing about us being crazy about Star Wars when we were little. Oh, mom, okay. mom would always sing... Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars, my children are crazed. (laughs) (laughs) What about Star Wars and Jedi's? Oh, yeah, that's a different thing. I don't know. She used to always sing that. (laughs) That's funny. That's cute. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, let's um, let's talk about more cute things the Sokols used to do. And uh, we'll be sharing a lot of things today, so stay tuned for Sokolism of the Day. Sokolism of the Day. And we're back here with Sokolism of the Day. Here to start this Sokolism off today, we have Sarah Sokol introducing the Sokolism topic of the day, which is... Uh, I'm not ready. Uh... <laughs> What's that voice you've decided to go with? <laughs> it's my not ready voice. <laughs> it's never ready. I don't know what to do. Um, all right, just kidding. I'm ready. What we're going to talk about today is the project known as Sokol Siblings Unite. Mm, yes. Now, this is a project that has been ongoing for a long time. I forget when we first started this, but it's been a few Kind of a few years ago. And we should and note then, also that it's the infamous prequel to Sokol Siblings, Sokol Siblings Reunite. Reunite, yes. That was <laughs> two about to two say. extensive <laughs> and separate um, projects. Yeah. Yeah. And we should probably call our current project Sokol Siblings Re Re Reunite. But <laughs> like <that. laughs> um, yeah, we, we had a. Uh, Just an idea of, like, we would get together and create some things. We would write, you know, we would give each other prompts, writing prompts or, you know, different types of ideas, and then we would all sort of fulfill them together. And um, we decided to just share some of these. We'll share the prompt if you, in case you want to do it yourself, and then we'll share some of the ones that we came up with uh, so you can have some examples. 
Well, hey, but before we get into the actual examples, yeah, uh, just yeah. one more thing that I remembered about like how this all started because I was trying to remember how we started doing this. And I think it was um, when you and I left for college. Yeah, it was over the summer. And we, we sort of split up the family. I think there was a couple of years where we got a little out of touch with uh, Emma and Steph. And, and, and then we were, we were bemoaning the fact that we were not really in touch anymore since we left the house. And so we started this email chain and that was where we started doing like creative writing prompts and stuff like that. And then it, yeah. and then it migrated over onto an actual document. Yeah. A little tip for people out there. Maybe if you're feeling a little disconnected in this, you know, time of not being able to see people normally, maybe try it out, have some no. fun. Nothing says I miss you like writing a better poem than them. <laughs> exactly. It can be a competition as well. We <laughs> can rate each other after the end of these. It's always a competition. <laughs> yeah. So should we get into some examples? Sure. Okay. So um, my, my prompts are kind of brief. The mm. prompt was write a limerick and then also write a poem that describes an abstract concept. Ah. But I happen to think that the limericks are more fun. So <laughs> Read the limericks. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start with one from Steph. I have, I have no memory of this. <laughs> yeah, it's Steph quite a few years ago. <laughs> there once was a man with feet lame who had a fine horse, which was tame. He tried getting on it, but fell on his bonnet. And now his head also is game. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know what the last line exactly uh, is game. Sure. Maybe <laughs> it's edible food. I don't know. I don't know what I meant by it. Uh, I heard uh, it in a fever dream. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is art, okay? Do not question it. Okay, yes. Just understand it and appreciate. <laughs> so this next one is actually by Sarah. And um, I like to think that it's the best one so far. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> Does it not end with, his head was a game? <laughs> <laughs> it's clever. Steph is like eight chess moves ahead of you. <laughs> you'll, you'll catch up with what I was trying to say in an hour, and you'll kick yourself. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right about the same time I'll, 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 I'll realize what you said, defeating the bourgeoisie <laughs> during our intro <laughs> conversation. All right. So, here is my limerick. There once was a man with no class, who tended to act like an ass. Then once as a prank, I gave him a spank, and that was the end of his sass. <laughs> that, that is so much great. better than mine. <laughs> um, did did Emma then, do one th on this one? No, Emma did not include a limerick. In fact, that was the last limerick, but um, I feel that I should include something from Nick, so... Here is the abstract concept for uh, the other poem. Okay. This I don't remember. I have a television and I never turn it off because it tells me where I'm going should I ever become lost. Sometimes I turn it towards the wall and watch it from behind just to hear the saints and sinners and remember they are blind. Familiar faces flashing on the front of my TV in a pattern that now passes from my new reality. The fleeting thought that flickers through the fog that is my mind is that perhaps I should be doing something better, something better, something better, <laughs> with my time. <laughs> Very ASMR there at the end. <laughs> I'm turning the lights and the camera and the action upon you, Nick. All right, well, I was reading through uh, some of the stuff in the original Sokol Siblings Unite, and one of my favorite projects was the altercation between individuals of fiction or history oh yes i'm so <laughs> excited <laughs> and i don't know that i have we have time to read through everybody's examples because these are pretty long actually yeah just pick like pick one of pick the funniest most hilarious and clever one well clearly that's mine but uh <laughs> <laughs> i think it genuinely is set you, up for that <laughs> you set me up for sounding like a pompous <laughs> asshole <laughs> <laughs> it's all my fault <laughs> alright so the prompt is describe an altercation between individuals of a fiction or of history and I chose uh, as the first character Judas Iscariot of the bible 
And as the second character will be revealed later on, <laughs> uh, he's talking to God here. So, ready? Absolutely. Yes. It was a dark and stormy night. Judas Iscariot fell to his knees as he crested the summit of the mountain. He gazed upward with eyes wide, set back in their dark, corrupted <laughs> sockets. Blood. Oh <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Blood oozed from the sores in his feet where they had dashed against the stones. Dark storm clouds growled vengefully in the sky above him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The words echoed like thunder in the caverns of his mind, hallowed of all other... Hollowed? Hollowed of all <laughs> other thoughts. <laughs> As rain began to fall in thick, oily droplets, he pulled his ragged cloak tightly around his shoulders and huddled beside a large boulder. Choking back tears of shame, he gasped, God! What have I done? <laughs> I the first so flash good. of lightning cut through the dark clouds and struck the mountaintop. There was a mighty crack as a massive boulder was split in two. Judas was violently hurled down the mountainside, where his fall was stopped by another stone. He lay on his back, too frightened to move, as the thunder rolled and the storm clouds roiled above him. It was then, in the wildest of nights, that a voice came from the churning clouds, a voice as deep as the thunder itself. Why do you defile my mountain with your blood and tears? Judas scrambled to his knees and replied in a ragged voice, I weep for shame because I have betrayed and killed my lord and savior. I love this voice so much. There was another brief flash of lightning in the distance and the voice continued, Who is this savior of whom you speak? I speak of your son, Jesus Christ. The one true God, oh, almighty, <laughs> he has been murdered and his blood... <laughs> God damn it. So good. <laughs> His blood is on my hands. <laughs> oh, the voice shit. boomed back now with an almost an air of incredulity. Uh, uh, I have many sons, but this Jesus of whom you speak, uh, I have not heard of him. <laughs> Judas, Judas was taken aback. He stammered, oh, I saw the sun darkened at midday. I saw the curtain of the temple torn in two. I had many doubts when I saw these things. I knew that I had betrayed my one Lord and God. There was a slight lull in the storm as the voice paused. Judas struggled to his feet and began slowly backing his way down the mountain. But there was a great flash of lightning across the sky, and the thunder exploded louder than before, and the voice returned with rage. The true god of gods is not betrayed by a mere mortal! Judas continued backing down the mountain slowly. He cried out in terror, Who are you? Who is it that speaks to me now? <laughs> The rain began pouring down in a raging torrent, and Judas quickened his pace as he attempted to scramble quickly down the rocks. I am Zeus, father of gods and men, and you have blasphemed against me this night, and for that, you are deserving of death. <laughs> Judas, in his hurry to get away, stumbled and fell headlong down a short slope. The last flash of lightning briefly lit up the mountainside, and the last clap of thunder shook the stones as Judas was reduced to a hissing skeleton, which soon crumbled into a powder. The rain subsided, the thunder and lightning ceased, and a few rays of hopeful sunshine shone over the horizon. A cool breeze gently lifted the ashes and scattered them across the mountainside. Savage. <laughs> <laughs> wow, beautiful! I have the obligatory clap. Thank you, oh. thank you. Well, that, that was, was fun. beautiful. That was so <laughs> epic, man. <laughs> I was seeing it. <laughs> you know, I modeled my voice of Judas off of a character from Star Wars. Um, um, who is it? The the rebel. It's a troop. Okay. No, no, no. In one of the newer movies. Um. Yeah, he has that kind of talk like that. Yeah. Yeah, who the yeah. hell is that um, character? Geez, Forrest the character? Whitaker. <laughs> it's not the character's name. No, I know, but isn't that the actor? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's Forrest Admiral Whitaker. Admiral Forrest Whitaker. Anyway, whatever Star Wars movie, Forrest Whitaker has a voice like that. That's the voice I was doing. <laughs> uh, he was Saw Guerrera. 
Saul Guerrero, Rogue, thank Rogue you. One. Yes. Oh, Rogue One. So it wasn't Ray. You no, know, I'm I'm always gonna pronounce Zeus the way you pronounced it from now on, which is Zeus. <laughs> I have Zeus. I have Zeus. <laughs> It reminds me of like Zeus. God Zeus. God Zeus. Yeah. <laughs> that was epic, Nick. Well told yeah, as yeah. well. Very uh, well told. Vivid picture in my head. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say this is probably weird, uh, but because I should have remembered that it was Zeus, but I was picturing that it was like Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be one of the presidents. <laughs> Yeah. That would awesome. be amazing. And then it was like, oh shit, it's Zeus. <laughs> would you like how I made up for the fact that, I mean, obviously, if you're a Christian and you're reading this, you, you might be kind of offended by the uh, changing of a Bible story. But in the end, Judas gets fried <laughs> by a lightning bolt. Yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't that kind of even it out a little bit? Very satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and clearly written by someone who's familiar with the Bible, so that has to count for something. Yes, that's it's an true. excellent Bible yeah. fan fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> it genuinely is. It's a Bible Greek mythology fanfic. <laughs> yeah. Crossover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, speaking of crossing over, we're now crossing out of the realm of the the Sokol siblings challenges specifically because so many of them just sort of inspired us gave rise to poetry that we wanted to create on our own and I think we want to represent that too um, especially maybe since you had mentioned last week Steph or I keep saying last week last episode you mentioned that that was a kind of an older poem and you maybe wanted to share some more recent? Yeah, yeah. So I was definitely still just learning how to, I mean, you never really stop, but I was just sort of learning how to write poetry at the time. So I like a lot of the ideas that I captured and some of the rhymes are fun, but like, I'm not a big fan of a lot of it, but it did help me learn through those um, projects a lot. The thing I have is actually really similar to what you might find in a Sokol Sibling Challenge, but I wrote it recently. Um, I was just kind of like out of it and awake in the morning and just had some thoughts about how I like being alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the result of that. If you ever wish to fall asleep, remember what it is to be awake, love, to take a breath and feel the wind mix with your bones. To know the place in which you stand is your home, your own. Remember what it is to love and to be loved, like sunshine through leaves on the cool of a summer evening, a flip in your heart every time you see her breathing, and what it feels to be with her, to feel her breathing closer still. The later in the evening chill will prick your skin, but you will only move closer, closer for warmth in the windy winding down of the day. Remember what it is to play amid the trees or in the city's lights, so free beneath the stars or perhaps beneath a street light, basking in the recklessness of a night not spent to remember. And when, love, you come to sleep at last, do not hesitate, but lay your sweet head upon the coolest side of the pillow, pull the blankets a bit tighter like so, and sit, slip so slowly and so warm forever to forget. But not yet, my love, not yet. Oh. Mm. I love that little, uh, the rhyming scheme at the end. Not not the most strictly rule-following poem I've ever <laughs> constructed. True, but it feels like a sonnet, you know? Mm. Yeah. Like it feels, has that feeling of a romantic Shakespeare sonnet. Yeah, even though it doesn't follow like the the same pattern and rhyming scheme and stuff, I think uh, it's clearly the work of someone who's written a lot of poetry and written a lot in in various formats. And so you just have a comfort with creating rhythm and yeah, it's some um, flow. It's prose with Works poetry really well. influences. No, it sounds like poetry to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and beautiful. Well, thank you. Beautiful poetry. Thank you. Yeah, really like. Just romantic imagery in well, it's like yeah. romantic but in but kind of sad also because yeah. it does sound like you're encouraging someone maybe who's in a really dark place, yeah, I mean that was the idea yeah. I was trying to capture because i've I've done that for 
for people in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And yourself. I but mean, yeah, yeah, that's true. calling yourself love, I think, is a really interesting interpretation of the poem as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I mean, I really didn't have anyone in particular in mind. It just flowed more interestingly. But mm -hmm. yeah, it could have been. I suppose it could be about me, and that would be an interesting take on it. That was beautiful. I feel like it's not the type of poem that you really applaud after, but <laughs> a thoughtful, a thoughtful, a thoughtful of applause. For the beautiful melancholy of life. Yeah. yeah. Well, I should, yeah, I could tell people that, that Steph is my, uh, has always been my poetry wizard guru <laughs> person. Muse. Yeah. Muse, yeah. Which you, you orig originally talked me into writing my first poem. And that was part of Sokol Siblings Unite. I had never written a poem before that. Really? So you were writing poem long, poems long before me. And you do it, um, it seems to come so easily to you. Like I think last time we were talking about doing those those flash poetry mm -hmm. things and you would always write your poem and finish with time to spare. And I always felt like I just couldn't start even start writing sometimes. So I... the benefit of this is that I get to use you as my lyricist. <laughs> <laughs> and in the moment when I'm writing a song and I need a lyric to go somewhere, I will text you and get a response back within... 15 minutes usually with lots of words on it always yeah. and it's just and amazing and then he'll be like you're a witch <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well thank you yeah i mean i think it just comes from um advice our mom gave me when i was trying to learn how to write essays better uh, i never knew how to start and i always tried to like plan the whole thing out and stuff and she just walked past me and i told her i was like getting really frustrated uh because i didn't know how to start and she just said start just start, just write a sentence and then keep going and then you can go back and fix it later. And I think that's always just been what I do is I'll just dive in and a lot of times it's trash and sometimes it's good, but the more output, the higher chance of it being good. She's really wise. I, I can't tell you how many times that's gotten me through a sticky place in my writing on my books as well, like that same advice that... If in doubt, just spit it out, bitch. <laughs> just write a terrible <laughs> sentence. Yeah. yeah, That's what I, I read this book called uh, Effortless Mastery when I was in high school by Kenny Werner, which is a music music related, not poetry related. But he had said the same thing about writing music. He was like, I dare you to sit down and write a terrible song. I'm like, I bet you can't do it. Like, you're <laughs> you're. You're a good musician. You're going to sit down. You're going to try to wrong, write a song that's bad. You, you probably can't do it. Don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Depressing life as soon as you sit down, Sorry. No, as soon, no, as, as, no. as soon as you sit down to write a bad song, you stop having all these expectations of yourself and this, this that you lose all your standards and basically you just start being creative and writing down whatever crap comes to your head and then it will probably lead you to write something good. Yeah, um, helps you open no. up. Kill the bourgeoisie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Gotta really get the creative juices flowing and kill the bourgeoisie. Yeah, you want to slit their throat when the creative juices are totally flowing. <laughs> and so play games with their heads. <laughs> and then, you, what do you put it on your pancakes? Or you're tapping into the creative juices of other people. To make, yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> to make creativity absurd. <laughs> Jesus. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> well... I have some exciting news, you guys. What's this? And I think in order to get to this exciting news, we may need to transition into the next section. All right. Which is Pointless Conjecture. Take me with you. Pointless Conjecture. Okay, here we are at the Pointless Conjecture. I've been waiting with masturbated breath. <laughs> God. Oh, God. <laughs> Wait, hang on. <laughs> uh, we have made an appeal to our dearest sister, Emma. We asked her to provide all three of us for a sort of brainstorming, what's it called when you get a bunch of smart people think in a room tank. together? Think tank. Think tank, yeah. We're going to think tank the answer to our dear sister's right. question. Incidentally, if and you spoonerize think tank, you get tink think, which is what you say when Tinkerbell does something nice for you. Aww. Aww. How long have you been sitting on that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that one just came to me. I pulled a step on that one and just went with it. <laughs> I 
I do believe in fairies. <laughs> tick thank. <laughs> All right, I'm so sorry. Come to your local community <laughs> think that tick thank. All right. What fictional disaster from literature, movies, TV shows, etc., do you feel like you would handle the most competently and why? And she specifies, for the sake of making it as interesting as possible, try to take the most improbable or unlikely situations, like Emma would never put a Sharknado on her list because she feels that for several reasons she would handle it very poorly. <laughs> the sharks and the natives, probably. <laughs> probably, uh, maybe the combination. <laughs> um Wait, you're allowed to you pick something that you would be good at? So, uh, yeah, it sounds like a fictional disaster of whatever kind, like X-Men Apocalypse or like, I don't know, what's another? Oh, uh, <laughs> We just watched X-Men Apocalypse. No Noah. Yeah, Noah. That's, that's a good a one. A fictional disaster. <laughs> Wait, so, uh, yeah, exactly. no, that probably doesn't count. I was going to say maybe Ender's Game, but no. I, I've never seen it. It's, it's not really Read a disaster it. movie, though. Yeah, but I would say you can make it about yeah. a disaster. It sounds like she yeah, wants it. No, to okay, there's zomb there's all the zombie movies. There's Armageddon. There's there's so many movies about uh, disasters destroying. There's there's several pandemic movies out there. Was it was it the 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 day after tomorrow when everything freezes over? Oh yeah yeah yeah. That would be my Ice disaster. Age. You like that one? Yeah. What would you do? How would you handle it? Um. You know, I would just go ice fishing. Die or no? <laughs> Wait, we don't have to. We don't have to save the world in this situation. I thought we were required to stop the disaster from happening or oh, geez. Or rescue everyone. Yeah, oh, that that makes it much yeah, harder. That's probably yeah true. Well, I I that's true. I'm not really a scientist. I couldn't really address any of the problems in the day after tomorrow issue. Yeah, but it's a hypothetical. You could make yourself a scientist. But I have to be oh, me. Okay. Like. If Emma wanted to solve the Sharknado problem, she could just make herself someone impervious to sharks and tornadoes. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so for mine, I'm going to be the rock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you're going to muscle your way out of this situation, whatever it is. <laughs> muscle your way through Armageddon. I don't know. I mm. It feels weird to say a movie that's based on like a real disaster. You know, like a tsunami movie or something? Because I'm going to be like, yeah, I'd definitely survive a tsunami while there are people, <laughs> like, in the world who know that that's probably not the case. Mm. I don't know. So, But fictional yeah. disasters. I don't know. I feel like disaster movies is never really a genre I got into. Uh, I know how, I know what I would do to get through the uh, the biblical flood. I consider that to be a fictional disaster. And... I think the solution is really simple, actually. More than one boat. Um, <laughs> and just save and, all the uh, terrible people. Yeah, and then you definitely <laughs> like if you're if you're you know s save the people, more people, and um, you know teach them how to be good rather than just killing them all. Maybe I'm actually God in this <laughs> example. I don't know. You know that does make <laughs> disaster movies easier. <laughs> <laughs> you're just make yourself god yeah. no okay even as noah well but make yeah more boats. like you're noah you hear the that the whole earth is going to be awash with crazy amounts of water and you're like oh i'm only gonna make enough for these animals and my family mm. like what kind of <laughs> selfish bastard well okay <laughs> to, to be fair i guess in the in the cartoon <laughs> movie of noah that i'm remembering <laughs> They're like the neighbors are standing around laugh at him, laughing at him for building. He's like, hey, Noah, expecting rain? That one. Right. He yeah. tries to like warn people. He tries to warn his neighbors yeah. and then they don't listen to him for some reason. And then he's like, well, I guess they all die. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> if the situation, uh, I mean, if the, if the, if the question is asking me how I would handle that disaster, I would handle it by making more boats. Probably prioritizing <laughs> people over many animals, unfortunately. Yeah, we're talking real handling of the disaster. Just establish, like, a boat-making factory. Get filthy rich. At least two more boats. There were not that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to get in. There on. were definitely less people back then. Like enough wood existed 
to make boats for everyone. <laughs> I don't know. As if that would have been the concern. No, trees were only starting out. They only had a few. <laughs> well, if you believe the Earth is only 10,000 years old. I guess, <laughs> yeah. There couldn't be, we wouldn't have giant redwoods by then. That's for sure. I I feel like I would die in most disaster movies, real or fictional. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the whole thing is like, it depends how you define a disaster. Because obviously, disaster implies the bad thing has already happened. Like, there's nothing to do about a huge earthquake. How do you handle that? You just handle it as best you can and then clean up afterwards. But like, a looming, an impending disaster, for me, I would pick the fifth element. Because... <laughs> There's, like, this slowly approaching darkness. Really? No, wait! I changed my mind. I would be Star Trek the whale movie. Oh, yeah, what was what was going to... Star Trek Voyage Home. It's a natural disaster for <laughs> whales, I guess. It's an approaching... It's an approaching, like, sentient force that's going to kill all life on planet Earth and is upsetting everything. And the answer is to get the fucking whales out of extinction oh, and right. have the whales Holy talk shit. to them. I could totally, I could drive around a spaceship and like get whales and <laughs> rescue whales Please. and bring them back Please, into the Sarah, present. Sarah, you don't know the first thing about <laughs> flying a spaceship. <laughs> well, I would ask the, the pilot to drive me into the past where there are whales. That's true. I mean, that's most of what um, Captain, what's his dick does kirk that's the one that's his dick yeah captain kirk's his dick it's kind of depressing to me that that uh in this in the star trek universe in the star trek future we have invented like faster than light space travel and yet whales are extinct. well okay i guess we we didn't decipher whale language before they went extinct like we had this amazing technology but somehow like the the whales died out soon enough in that future that we didn't even have time to learn their language. Yeah, we didn't even figure out that it wasn't an even more advanced language than Which our language. Which I suspect is true. I have no backing for this. Well, it's like an emotional language, right? We don't really know for sure, but... I mean, it's not language. I, I like to imagine that it is. It's not language by, like, the technical definition linguists would use, but... It's just like... Emotion... But they, I mean, they do seem to be intentional <laughs> about how they make those those noises, and they have different sounds that represent different whales in the pod. Like they have names for each other and stuff like that. Mm. I um, think I maybe mean, so... they're just starting to acquire language, and they're gonna get way more advanced in the next couple hundred thousand years. Oh, you think so? Oh, interesting. Like they're slowly evolving into the most intelligent marine life. <laughs> it's well, I wonder possible. if they're. Their ability, like, I don't know what it feels like to have amazing echolocation like that, but I wonder if the fact that they have that echolocation, if they're able to, like, feel each other's emotions or see, they have that, literally have a sixth sense. So I wonder if that would, like, negate the need to communicate as articulately yeah. as we seem to have to. Like, we can't even think it if we can't say it, right, if we don't have yeah. language for it. But maybe whales have an advantage with the extra sense. That's how I think of it. <laughs> and, like, we've recently discovered all three of us secretly identify as whales. <laughs> That's true. Well, it's my spirit animal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to be... And we decided on this separately. Oh, I was just going to say I used to be into turtles, but I'm so over that now. <laughs> turtles are so, like... Man, that's too High bad because I really am doing a turtle painting right now that's turning out pretty I, I Okay, I'll admit, <laughs> I, I still fucking love turtles. <laughs> I just think, I mean, I'm more impressed with whale as a species, but turtle, turtle is philosophically is cool. Like it just takes life slow mm. and it's, it's got a shell that it can go inside. And, Very uh, introvert. Yeah. And this has been the news from La La Land, uh, where we are down with the proletariat. And the whales are inventing sexolocation. And the stars are all at war. Oh, because of Star Wars. Yeah, because of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs>
If you are enjoying this show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, or simply email us at voiceofsocal at gmail.com. We would love to hear your feedback. The theme music for this podcast was written and recorded by Nick and Sarah Sokol, and the music you are hearing right now was performed by the band Nuage on their album, Nuf, available on iTunes and Spotify. The News from La La Land is a production of Voice of Sokol. To learn more about the Sokols and their creative content, head to voiceofsokol.com.